Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Ron. He uh, is finishing up his PhD in uh, the Max Planck Institute in Germany. He did his undergrad and master's in the IIT uh, in India, working on uh, vision. He used to work in inference algorithms and graphical models for vision problems. Now he's working on how to embed uh, prior knowledge into CNN for vision uh, applications. applications yeah. So, Ron. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and, giving, and for this great opportunity to talk in front of you. And I'm Arun Jampani, and I'm a PhD student at Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems in Tübingen, Germany. And I am, I am mainly interested in advancing techniques for tackling vision problems. For, uh, there are broadly two main approaches for tackling vision problems. One is generative approaches, where we can introduce prior knowledge, and we can get quantified uncertainties. And the second one is discriminative approaches, which are fast and are directly learned from the data. And both have their complementary advantages. On, on one hand, the generative models uh, uh, need less data, and, but the inference is slow. On the other hand, discriminative approaches, they are fast, but they require a lot of training data. So the main research question that I have been asking during my PhD is like, how can we combine both these generative models and discriminative models for ba faster and better inference in vision. So towards this aim, uh, I have been working on a few, few projects. Like one is informed sampler, where we learn to do sampling. Second one is consensus message passing, where we learn message passing. And the third one is learning bilateral filters. And in this talk, I will, I will give very very brief summary of first two works before going into detail on the learning bilateral filters stuff. So just a summary of informed sampler. This is joint work with Sebastian Novozin, Matthew Loper, and Peter Gehler. Here, the research question we are trying to answer is how to invert existing graphics engine. For example, an example is shown here. For example, a graphic system can take 3D mesh as input and produce depth image as output. And the inverse problem would be like going from depth image to 3D mesh. So how can we invert such graphic systems? So since graphic systems are complex, it is difficult to do inference, invert them. So generally, MCMC sampling techniques are applied. They are generic, but they are generally too slow. And our, our solution to speed up is to we, we propose a mixture sampling technique we, where we do sampling with a mixture of mixture proposals, with a mixture of local and global proposals. And the global proposals are learned using some discriminative approaches, like CNN and random forests. So our experiment showed that the global proposals help in quick mixing in the exploration of the space, while the local proposals helps in higher acceptance rate of the sampler. So this is a very brief summary of this informed sampler. And the second work, this is done at Microsoft Research Cambridge with Ali Eslami, Daniel Tarlo, Pushmit Kohli, and John Wynn. Uh, this is on consensus message passing. Here the task is to do inference in hierarchical graphical models in vision. For example, many, many, many graphical models in vision are hierarchical in nature. An example of phase generative model is shown here, where we do inner product with normals and light to get shading. And when you multiply with the reflectance, you get observation. Here the task is given the observation in for these other variables. So this inference in such models is generally performed using message passing techniques. So we implemented this in infra.net, probabilistic programming language, and we and we found that the standard message passing, like variational message passing or expectation propagation, fails in this case. So our solution is that we, we learn certain key, certain key messages in this message passing, which we call consensus messages, using discriminative approaches. And we observe that it helps in converge message passing to better solution and also faster convergence. And it also shows, and this is one of the first examples where we show that infra.net can be used to tackle vision problems. <clears throat> so the overall aim for these two works is like, how can we leverage discriminative techniques for inference in generative models? Like the, for in informed sampler, we learn to sample. In consensus message passing, we learn to pass messages. 
So we, we observe in both of the techniques, we observed significant speed ups over baseline inference techniques, baseline MCMC or baseline message passing techniques, but still not fast enough for, gen, for practical purposes. This is one of the main issues with generative models. Inference in generative models is somewhat slow and it's not practical. So next we ask this question, can we, can we go in the different directions? Can we propagate information inside discriminative models like CNNs? For example, the CNNs have been shown to be quite useful in solving many vision problems, in tackling many vision problems. So can we, can we, add, can we add prior knowledge into these CNNs? So this kind of different direction from going from gen using prior knowledge to, to inference in discriminative models. So with this question, so I will start with the main topic of the presentation, which is learning to propagate information across pixels. This is joint work with Martin Kiefel, Raghudeep Gadde, and Peter Geller. So just as a motivation, natural images exhibit high level of pixel interdependency. For example, all the, all the sky pixels are blue in color in this, in this figure. But the pixels are generally represented with independent values. So many of the vision techniques uh, try to capture this pixel interdependency by propagating or pulling information across pixels. So one of the simplest and fastest and most used way of propagating information across pixels is spatial convolution. So this, is, this forms the basic building blocks of most CNNs like LXNet CNN or VGG network and other things. So let's uh, look deeply into spatial convolution with a Gaussian filter example. So these are spatial convolution works. We, we have some filter, you, you, you convolve at every pixel in the image and you get some output. So here is an example with a Gaussian filter, you, you get some smooth image as output. So here filter is defined with respect to position differences with respect to center pixel. In general, the spatial convolution can be defined like this, where V is the input, Vtick is the output. For every ith output pixel, it is a linear combination over the neighborhood N for all J pixels. It is a weighted linear combination weighted with respect to filter weights. And the filter weights are defined with respect to position differences, Pi minus Pj with respect to the center pixel. So this is how mathematically we can define spatial convolution. So next bilateral filter, this is a generalization of spatial convolution to arbitrary feature spaces. So here, here the filter is defined not only with respect to position differences, but also within, with respect to feature differences. This need not be only position. So the most used features are, for example, the most used features are position and color, X, Y, R, G, B. And the most used kernel is Gaussian kernel for bilateral filter. So is this definition clear? For thing? Yep. And so what does it mean that the filter depends on the position, uh, filter depends on the feature differences, not just the position of the tail? So a quick question, how do you define features? They are like engineered features in the defined in the input output RBG of the image? Yeah, at present the most, almost all the uses of bilateral filters are generally the engineered features like it is mostly XY RGB. Uh, XY RGB is kind of synonymous to bilateral filter, but it can be general features. Yeah, I will I will show in one of our later works that we learn these features also. We can learn this. But I'm assuming that the sigma should not be a scalar value because it has to be weighted based on the yeah, feature yeah. itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sigma sigma can go inside as a scale for features. Right. Yeah, you can either scale the features or scale your filter kernel. So generally it is implemented by scaling the features. It is and uh, and use fixed fixed kernel width kind of thing. Okay. Is it clear? But, but usually you don't uh, you don't you don't like for example when you do the normal conventional bio filter mm -hmm. where you have the range and the space, people mm -hmm. don't normally use the same Sigma for both. Yeah, yeah, for both, yeah. For it's kind of yeah, different sigma for both. Yeah, so, so uh, yeah, maybe it's yeah, sense. maybe it's kind of yeah, it's kind of misleading. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Yep. Okay, so what does it mean to have the the filter depends on both position and color color differences? This means that bilateral filter depends on the image content. As you can see in this example, the filter kernel differs where 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 we are computing that filter. For example, here filter looks like this and here filter looks like this. So after the 
here we, are, we can also see the image after the filtering. As you can see, it is smoothing the image, but it is also preserving the edges. This is one of the most important properties of bilateral filter. So one of the main computational hurdles for it is like it is, it is computationally expensive to, to define, to compute filter at each, at each location in the image. It's kind of computationally expensive. So, but the good news is that there are several fast approximations exist. So we will use one such approximation, which is high dimensional linear approximation. So I will, I will quickly explain this using a 1D example. What is this? What is it approximation? So let's say we are given this 1D signal, input signal, with just some intensity values. And let's say we want to do filtering using position and intensity features, bilateral filtering. So this technique involves first splatting to this feature space, 2D feature space, position and intensity, splatting these values, and then do convolution, Gaussian convolution in this 2D space. This is not exact Gaussian convolution. There is also some kind of normalization because to account for these missing values. There is also some kind of normalization. And then you go back to the original space and you can uh, read back in the original locations to get to the filtered thing. So each of these operations can be, can be given as a matrix multiplication. S plat, W, and S slice. So that's why it is a linear operation, linear high dimensional operation. So here, the, one of the main causes for the approximation is that we are splatting. When we are splatting, we, are, we have to extrapolate the input signal into the, into the corner points in the high dimensional space, high dimensional feature space. For example, here, position and intensity. So this is the main thing. So is this, is this clear or any questions here? Yeah. yeah. As I was just saying, it, 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 it would be good to actually uh, sort of write down the concrete computational complexity of the original, uh, of the original operation and this operation, right? And how yeah, many dimensions you, so, like, uh, depending on how many features you have. So, yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, the, yeah, there is a paper from Adams et al. And yeah, he gave nice plots for like, what's, yeah, which kind of lattice is useful for which kind of dimensions. Right, I mean, there are, I mean, the, the downside for this is that your representation is a lot fatter because mm -hmm. you're basically lifting the high dimensional space. space. And, and the inner signal is very sparse. Right, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. And and, um, and then you've got to decide, like, the size of the splat and so on and so forth. There's a lot of magic numbers that you need to tweak. The field. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, there are some. So, so question, is there only one um, like sigma parameter in the Gaussian convolution which is determining what is remaining as black in the right side figure? Because the splatting is basically filling up and then some areas are remaining black. Yeah, this is, this, is, this is mainly probably due to because there is no, there is no data here. I mean, right, not, so it means that there's some implicit sigma of that Gaussian convolution. Yeah, there determined. is some, yeah. I so use some fixed sigma here. But usually it's like a fixed sigma. Yeah, yeah. Generally, people use fixed sigma, but they change the they change the grid with some scale. The grid. I see. Okay, I see. So this also answered Sing Bing's question. Same yeah, thing. they scale the grid. Yeah. yeah. So one of the problem with these high dimensional grids is that the the corner points increase exponentially with the dimensions with mm -hmm. two power d. For example, if for for two d. The simplex has four four corner points. For three D, it's cube. For four D, it has sixteen corner points. So Adams et al. proposed another grid lattice, which is which is more suitable for bilateral filtering. Here, the corner points increase linearly with dimensions. Here, for for two two D, the simplex is triangle. For three D, it's tetrahedron. So the number of corner points, and so here the simplices are much more compact. So there will be less discretization artifacts when we are splatting to this high dimensional space. So we also follow this permutohedral lattice one. And it is shown to be more suitable for five dimensions, six dimensions kind of thing. If we go further high dimensions, there are some other data structures called KD trees, which are more suitable. For, for most of the vision problems, five dimensions are reasonably good. What are the, what are the dimensions? Is that the features? Uh, what? Would that be like the XY RGB? Yeah, XYRGB feature. So many, many, many of the vision problems XYRGB is used. So that's why we choose this lattice thing. 
So this involves so the using the permto hydro lattice to do the bilateral filtering involves first splatting the input image to this high dimensional feature space defined by the permto hydro lattice, and then doing convolution in this space. I have shown some illustrated the Gaussian filter here, and then slicing back to the original image space. So all the existing works use hand designed filter weights, nothing like Gaussian or Laplacian. I think it is mostly Gaussian. So just to just to give you an idea of how this lattice looks like since it's high dimensional I mean for example for this sample image this is how the lattice looks like if we are using position features so pixels falling in the same simplex are shown with the same color mm -hmm. so here all of these pixels fall in the same simplex in this position that is and here is the, these are the lattice looks like when we are using color features for example all these sky pixels fall into same simplex these are the lattice looks like when you're using position and color features. Right? Projection of the lattice. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is a, this is a projection of the lattice into the 2D space. Just some visualization, just to give you an idea of how the, so what it is doing when we are splatting. It, it is kind of a grouping the pixels together. Mm -hmm. thing. And maybe a new question, on, like maybe yeah, I'm asking sure. that people already knew by default, but how do you specify the? The x y size that will be mapped into one. Yeah, that is a very that is a very good question. Yeah, here here we are using particular x y size. I mean, depending on particular scale for this, we get smaller triangles and bigger triangles. I see. So, so these are hand-tuned parameters. Yeah, these are hand-tuned parameters, and uh, this is just for visualization. Yeah, these are hand-tuned parameters. Yeah. Because it's more like a, an image dependent. Yeah, it's more like image dependent. Yeah, these kind of hand-tuned parameters for this, which I which I did not show here. But, yeah. Any questions? Okay, so one of the main advantages of this using high dimensional filtering is that high dimensional approximation is that we, know we, we, we do not need to stick for spatial grid organization. I can take any number of input points in arbitrary locations and splat them. And it can be list of any unordered points, example 3D points. And input and another advantage is that the input and output points can be different. I can, I can splat certain points and I can read out in some other points. So there are many side advantages for this technique. So I will, I will show how, how we use this in our experiments later. So one of the core technical contributions of this work is learning bilateral filters. All the existing works use fixed filter kernel, fixed hand-tuned filter kernel. So, so what we, our, our key insight is that instead of using Gaussian filter, we can actually parameterize these filter values using some free parameters, and we can learn these values. Yes. But the, the question is, what's the intent of applying a bilateral filter in your case? What was the intent? What's the intent? What, what's the goal? What's what, the what goal? Do you want? I mean, you apply bilateral filter, is it for denoising? Is it for segmentation? Yeah, for, for there, there, there are many, many applications. Yeah. I will. I will I will come to that. I mean this is this is more general technique of how can we generalize bilateral filters and it has many applications. I will come to that later. So here we can we can get the derivatives using permutatorial approximation because splatting, convolution and slicing are linear operations. They are matrix multiplications. We can actually get the derivatives for this using standing standard matrix calculus. Derivatives with respect to input V and also derivatives with respect to filter weights. But you, have to, uh, but you have to sort of uh, think about the size of the, the triangles, right? Yeah, there is still that. some kind of cross validation going on, validation going on. But but still, the actual bilateral filter also has this yeah has this problem. No, but from a task perspective, right? Especially. If you are trying to solve a particular task, right, mm -hmm. and you're trying to minimize uh, some sort of a risk, yeah, right, and uh, you're learning the parameters here, and and the obj and that and that risk is linear in. Uh, uh, in these parameters, but mm -hmm. then there are other parameters that you have to sort of search over. For oh, sure, yeah, yeah, that is kind of the future work we are actually planning. Actually, we want to also learn those also. So That's how would you go about learning them? Uh, it is not very clear at this point. We are still working on it, like uh, because in in another approach, actually, we are actually we can actually explicitly do this bilateral filtering. Actually, we don't need to use this approximation. Uh, suppose we have hundred super pixels in an in an image. We can actually compute explicitly bilateral filter. It is a, so suppose we have thousand thousand super pixel. It is a thousand by thousand matrix. Mm -hmm. It is not a huge matrix. So we can mm -hmm. explicitly compute. So with this, we can easily get 
derivatives with respect to these filter scales, future transformation, mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I thought that splatting, it looked like it, it's a binning operation, so I don't, I'm not understanding how it's a matrix. Operation. Actually, I, I, was, I was about to say that splatting in the graphic sense mm -hmm. is like taking a paintball and splatting it, right? So essentially, okay. what you see, sorry, is convolved is actually part of splatting. Yeah, there is also some kind of uh, Gaussian convolution involved in splatting yes, and sliding. Yes, because what you're doing, what you call splatting, is essentially what Jacob just said, right? Essentially, it's just binning. But then, yeah, binning. But when you do a, a binning and then you actually do a convolution, mm -hmm. right, to make the spatial extent bigger, that's, mm -hmm. that's the operation called splatting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we can we can we can view we can view splatting as a different discretization of the input points. But I'm trying so to what is how, do you, the, how do you implement a discrete? Discrete binning, binning as a matrix multiplication. So here, here this is a big matrix. Let's say for this two D case, there are these lattice points. Let's say there are thousand lattice points, and this let's say there are thousand input. Let's say there are two thousand input points, mm -hmm. and let's say there is a thousand lattice points. So this 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 matrix defines the barycentric coordinates how how do you, how do you go from this point oh, so, so there, there is a there's a there's a there's a discretization step that happens before that's implicit that you don't show here that on the v to to to, to assign to the heart yeah that is that is exactly the splatting splatting involves extrapolating this signal to these corner points using barycentric coordinates yeah that's that's not splatting <laughs> okay and uh, using the wrong term uh, but if, in if, you look at, if you look at Paul Hackbutt's original paper on EWA, he designed, he, that was the original use of the word splat. Oh, okay. I don't know. So we got these terms from Andrew Adams' paper. So yeah, a lot this, of the new papers use this S slice, S splat. I've seen that, like, also um, Baron. Baron, yeah, Baron is work. also working on yeah, this problem. And, and basically, they're just positive uh, coefficients, right? Fractional values on every row that says mm -hmm. take each value of the. Each, val each pixel value and spread it to these five bit points. It will be like yeah. five non-zero coefficients in each row, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's like yeah. a diagonal matrix. We can like we can actually matrix. think of this as a discretiz some other discretization of continuous signal, right? I mean, for example, image is one kind of discretization of continuous signal, mm -hmm. and this is some other discretization of continuous signal. Mm -hmm. I think. Okay, so, discretization. so the input so V is a, is a sparse matrix. It's not it's not the actual pixel value. It's the sparse matrix representation of it. Yeah, it is kind of you can you can you can consider V as a okay. set of points. Yeah, I don't know exactly if the how, if the if the terminology is correct, but it's kind of standard terminology used in bilateral filter community. I don't know. Um, in the more recent community, I think the original yeah. uh, the definition of splatting I mean, is... Sorry, I, I don't want to rant, but you know, it's just like people say super resolution when you try is up sampling. Yeah. It just drives me up the wall. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, never mind. Okay. Never mind. I'll stop my rant right now. <laughs> okay, yeah. So is everything clear? So we can, we can actually uh, get these derivatives with respect to filter weights and also with respect to input. We can learn using back propagation techniques like stochastic gradient descent. Okay, so what is the use of learning bilateral filters? So it has many interesting consequences. We, we actually studied these three. One is we can actually learn problem-specific bilateral filters. So we can actually also generalize spatial CNNs to use bilateral filters, which we call bilateral neural networks. And we can also generalize the dense CRFs. I will, I will explain each of these in, it, in, in detail. Next. So first, the first one, learning problem-specific bilateral filters. Bilateral filters has wide range of applications in vision, graphics, and image processing, and there are probably several hundreds of papers on just using bilateral filters. Surprisingly, all these papers use just Gaussian filter and XYRGB features. I, think. I mean, most of this. So we 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 want to study whether we can, whether by learning bilateral filters we can get any improvements or this. So we actually studied three different problems. One is joint bilateral upsampling, next is image denoising, third is 3D mesh denoising. So because of time constraints, I will mainly go into joint bilateral upsampling in detail. <clears throat> so what is joint bilateral upsampling? So this is a task of upsampling a low, low resolution input with bilateral filter constructed using guidance image. So I will, I will explain this using a toyish example. Like, Let's say we have this low resolution input, input color image. And we want to upsample it using a full resolution grayscale. 
image. We can actually construct the filter using these features from the guidance image. For example, here the, here the features can be x, y, and intensity. So we can actually construct the filter using this. And V comes from the low resolution input image. And when we, when we do this bilateral filtering, you can get a high, re, high resolution color image. But in this See? case, you, you limit your features not to include color. It's kind of like anything that's in the guidance, but yeah. in the original. So original case, kind of, yeah. Is, is it kind of hurting you? Because you might also need to use some features that are completely not in the guidance. Like this is not the case. Normally, you kind of you yeah you maybe think the guidance it is actually up, up front. So this is something in the setup of the problem. Yeah, in the you in the setup of, of the problem. For example, this of, this is kind of a toyish example. Right? For example, the original original problem will be let's say the image colorization. How does it work? People people do some scribbles on the on the grayscale image, saying that this is red, this is yellow, kind of thing. I see. So we can actually those are that is the input. To your algorithm. To the guidance. So this kind of like included added more information to the guidance image. No, that is just the input, and the guidance is only the grayscale image. Okay. I see. I see. So that is a, that is a more natural setting, but here for the ease of studying, we just take this artificial setting. So yeah, here the features come from the guidance image. This is called joint bilateral sampling. It is. So we worked on the color upsampling on Pascal VOC data set. For example, for this 8x upsampling, these are the results. This is a low resolution color image. This is grayscale image. And let's say this is a ground truth for the high resolution color image. And this is a bilinear interpolation. We're doing bilinear interpolation of that. And this is a result with the Gauss, Gauss bilateral upsampling. When you're using bilateral upsampling with Gaussian filter. And this is a result with the Lerent bilateral upsampling. Mm -hmm. As you can see, with the with the learned bilateral upsampling, the low low level details are better preserved, kind of thing. And we also did some quantitative analysis with different upsampling factors, and we found that the learned bilateral upsampling we can get better PSNR values compared to Gaussian. Yeah. So uh, in this problem setup, you learned one filter, right? From a, yeah. From a training from set. a training and set, then we learned it to new the, yeah, images, and you're yeah. now evaluating. It. Yeah. Yeah. So, so no th this is kind of single filter application. Single filter. Application. Yeah. The filter is not getting adapted to the actual data, your uh, actual image you're running it on. No, this is kind of we have some training data and we train the filter on that, and we apply the same filter mm -hmm. for all the test images. Okay. Yeah. Actually, I'm not sure I would totally agree with that because different images have different levels of noise, uh, so, so it should be yeah. noise adaptive rather than yeah. just looking at the data itself. So in other words, if you train it on images that have very little noise, and I give you an image that is relatively noisier, then it will not work. Yeah, sure, sure, yeah. yeah. But this is general setup in denoising, right? I mean, we assume certain level of noise model. Well, uh, even in the context of In the context problem. problem, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, uh, I did not show the, the, the results here, but actually we also studied Training for one upsampling factor and then testing in different upsampling factor. We 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 actually observed it is kind of quite uh, robust to that. A bit robust to that. Wait, yeah. uh, so how many? So this was a super. This was just supervised learning task, right? So how many? Yeah. How many training samples do you have? How many training samples? Here we use from the Pascal VOC data set. There are around 1,500 images. And for, so what is the upsampling factor? Is that is that how much the low resolution was? Yeah, these are different upsampling factors. We experimented with like 8x, 8 times upsampling, 2x. Does that mean, does that, mean that how what low resolution the, the low resolution images? What does that refer to? Yeah, for example, this, this means that the, we need to, for every 8th pixel, we need to interpolate 8 times. 8 but times did, zoom. Did you, were all of the low resolution images exactly the same resolution? Uh, uh, the, the question is, 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 it, is, it, is, it, is it robust to, if, if, does, the, does the low resolution have to be the exact same resolution in order for it to generalize at all? Or if it, yeah, because, yeah uh, we, we actually trained for particular, particular upsampling, particular low, low resolution, for example, two times upsampling, four times upsampling. But we actually found out that even if we, even if we train on four times upsampling and if we test on eight times, it is still generalized. So question, Jacob's question is, say the original uh, resolution is, uh, is, say, something, right, is, mm -hmm. is k, mm -hmm. right? Now, 
did you train with uh, K by two or, or and and K uh, and kept it constant and then basically uh, or what was what was constant was K con was this resolution the target resolution constant or whether you uh, yeah the K by it? two K this this two is constant okay so K, so K is the target thing and then K and by then two K by, K by two is four K by eight K by eight and K by sixteen yeah exactly so the yeah. two resolution things are not are not constant or the but target is target is oh, okay sorry. and wh what's the order of magnitude of learned parameters in this uh, I not remember exactly what are, well, like, it's rough is it is it the tens. order of a thousand or a million or ten I, I don't uh, around tens in terms of points tens kind of thing okay ten. it's a single filter it's, it's a, a single filter enumerate all the values filter, yeah. So we also apply this on depth of sampling. For example, CNN depth estimation results are often low resolution. For example, we take the CNN from Eigen et al. And uh, so this is a sample image, and this is the output of the CNN, which is bilinearly interpolated. And we can we can actually use the original image as the as the guidance, and we can get constant bilateral filter in using the original image and and filter these to get. Things. So with this small with this small of a number of parameters, don't you think that something maybe like a like a, like a pretty typical non-differentiable search, like, um, you know, what, what are some of those, the, like those? Bayesian optimization. Yeah, sure, yeah, sure, sure. I mean, here, here the whole point of these experiments is that we are not trying to solve these problems. Okay. We, are, we are actually showing that there are these hundreds of these paper which use single bilateral filter for many applications. So we, we want to show that we can actually improve over them by so, but my, my thing is that with this, with the small number of, if, there, if you're only learning on the order of ten parameters. Oh, okay. Number of parameters then, here. Then, then you don't really need differential. Oh, okay. So, 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 so you're, you're, you're asking number of parameters, right? So here it's kind of like, here, here it is a five-dimensional space. So we took one neighborhood. So it's around five hundred parameters, something okay. like that. It's not that. Yeah. Around six hundred something. Yeah. So again, like taking neural networks. The bilateral filtering can can be thought of as a as a layer, right? Yeah, sure. I will I will come to that. I will come to that later. Exactly. Yeah, I will I will exactly come to that later. So this this is the result of Gaussian bilateral upsampling. This is the result of learned bilateral upsampling. We get slight improvements using the learning for this, and we tested this on NYU depth data set, and we get slight improvements in terms of RMSE, but visually. You can see better improvements. Yeah, Thank but the problem is, is actually hallucinating depth, right? It's yeah. hallucinating depth based on on the texture of the RGB. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm not quite sure. I mean, apart from making sure that the edges are crisper, mm -hmm. anything else, it's you can't really trust it. Yeah, so sure. Yeah, sure. Like yeah, this is the, mainly the case, right? You see, all, you see the texture of the boats. But yeah, that's it is actually kind of, not correct. Don't yeah, it is not. It is not correct. I mean, but it's kind of helps a little bit in kind of. Yeah, it's not just there. Just yeah, yeah. It is. As you can see, it is not big improvements. And actually, Baron also had one paper that yeah. I mean, on it, depth it, defocus. Rather than showing this, it would be nice to show an error map, and then you yeah, see the see. distribution of the correctness, right? And yeah, you're going to see true. that only certain parts of it will be better. The rest mm -hmm. are not going to help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. These kind of preliminary studies to show that this could be used here. I mean, yeah. We are also not very convinced that this is a good way to go for upsample depth. Yeah. Not convinced. There are also other techniques that we should. Yeah. 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 How do you come up with the ground truth in these setups? Uh, because there is a ground truth. Oh, there is a sensor. sensor. Yeah. I think this is Prush Smith his paper. Um, ECCV. Yes, we collected uh, some data with Connect, so which has a RGB and a depth sensor. So that's the, so, so, so there is a ground truth sensor. Yeah. Yeah. But the sensor has a low, it's low resolution, right? The Connect is which low resolution, so you yeah. could down sample even more. Yeah. Okay. So one of the main advantages of this is that of this bilateral filtering is that it can be easily extendable to 3D data. I mean, the input can be any unordered list of points, right? So it just needs some features for each of these points. So for example, this can be applied to 3D, 3D mesh denoising. I'm not going into details here, but I mean, this can easily apply to 3D points and an ordered set of points. For example, here I, I show a noisy mesh. This is a synthetic noise. 
and we can actually denoise it using a data and and here here we use the normals as features so, so one, one of the questions which i think singh was also asking in the in the context of the previous application hmm. was that uh, the bilateral filter was it what uh, what is it learning right uh, so mm -hmm. is it learning something very local about the surface or is it learning something more uh, more global and actually some something about the structure or geometry of scenes, right? And, yeah, sure, and, sure, and yeah, this, yeah, 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 right, this, is, this is a very... That. Now, in, okay. in this context, again, in this particular application, is the bilateral filtering, uh, filter that you learn learning something about uh, the topology or the, or, or, the, or the shape of parts of the human body, mm -hmm. or is it learning something, uh, something very local about the properties of the surface? Yeah, that's a, that's a very very interesting question. Actually, actually, we we try to study a little bit like how how the how the filters are changing mm -hmm. compared to Gaussian, but it's kind of difficult to study because there is a high dimensional thing. Yeah. And we actually projected it, and visually we did not see so much difference. You know. So uh, so the question is, if we go back to the previous application, mm -hmm. what would it take, right? If suppose you, you uh, so I I, I I see that what you're what you're trying to do is basically say say here uh, see here's the bilateral filtering approach, and we can now uh, make this approach better by learning parameters, right? That's the obvious. Uh, thing right, and that's obvious contribution. That now we have a we have we have shown how to do learning of, mm -hmm. of, the, of the actual yeah. kernel, right? That that's obvious, right? That's yeah. the technical contribution. Mm -hmm. Now, from a task specific point of view, right? If mm -hmm. somebody were, if if your objective was not to propose a new algorithm, your objective was to solve a particular problem. A problem, yeah. Then how would you go about it, right? So if you look at that the result, mm -hmm. the the bilateral the learned bilateral up something result, and say okay now. Actually, I want to solve this problem. I want to get to the mm -hmm. ground, ground truth depth, depth. Right? This is a valid yeah, problem. It's a very interesting problem. problem. I, I really want to do this. Right? Yeah. So how would you go about doing it? Right? Uh, is there an extension of your approach? Uh, do you would you basically uh, do this at um, uh, at um, uh, at multiple scales? Is there an extension that you think can capture? The yeah, exactly. We can do this multiple scales? scales and multiple feature levels, yeah. and also. Designing the features is the key, right? Features. Mm -hmm. For example, here we use X, Y, R, G, B, which might not be very good for depth. Yeah. Maybe we need to use different features for for this problem and mm -hmm. different pro kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, actually, actually, we have more better applications. I will okay. come to that later. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm, and we will discuss this more. Okay. I think. Yeah. So, can, can like that problem be solved more directly? Are there is, it, is there a state of the art which just uses normal CNNs the way that people normally use them that does better than than this? Works. Yeah, this is, a, this, is a, this is a this is a CNN work, and actually they they actually improved the CNN in in more recent works. This is this is one of the state of the arts when, so when even, we work on even, it. Even just the baseline gas, they can't even beat the baseline Gaussian right now. With the, with the no, 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 the, the point is they this the, uh, the the image on the 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 result on the extreme left is the output of a CNN. That's what I'm saying. It looks worse than than the Gauss bilateral upsampling, which yeah, it seems like a pretty yeah, exactly, exactly. So so actually, what they what they say is in their in their paper is that we did not use they they did not use any upsampling methods because they did not get good improvements with in terms of number. I see. They did not get any. Good improvements on sample. So, so they say it's okay. Whatever upsampling we use, we are getting almost same number. So, but actually, visually, it makes more difference. Kind of thing. RMS is kind of per pixel thing, right? Here, it's. So, uh, one question was: uh, if you have a linear, did you try to do back back propagation end to end? Because if they. If you take the CNN depth out, out output, output as a result, yeah, and, you right. and you do post-processing, post right? yeah, and yeah. you're essentially learning to post-process yeah, yeah, right, sure. in this context. Now, what you can do is, instead of learning to post-process, you can just say, OK, let let me just take the whole thing. The whole thing and, uh, and actually back it. Yeah, yeah. So actually, actually we could also do, do that, but we did not try it. Oh, you didn't try that. And right here, yeah. So that would be a good thing to try, right? Try, to, yeah. to actually look at the whole thing back. Whole thing back, back to it, yeah. Because we are actually focusing on many different applications, and we did not go into depth. In, So another important consequence, and and this is what we are most excited about, is that this learning bilateral filters is that we can actually generalize the neural networks to use bilateral filters, which we call bilateral neural networks. Mm -hmm. So actually, we don't need to stick to single filter. We can actually initialize. We can use multiple filters and initialize them randomly, and we can learn mm -hmm. end to end. So this was not possible 
with with the Gaussian filters because if you use Gaussian filters all filters would be same. Mm -hmm. So we can actually randomly initialize and learn them together and we, we call this bilateral convolution layer such layer and we call such network as bilateral neural networks. So we actually did some preliminary studies on where this could be used and we are still trying to find out possible applications. So for this. you extend RBG to like number of input filter uh, uh, feature maps that you have in the network, right? Uh, can you so you can, you can instruct your features in the middle layers of the CNN. Mm -hmm, yep. Yes, right? Okay. So, so we can, XY, we can actually use, but, but, but here we are still using XY RGB. Uh, this technique is still not extended to learn the features. I see. The features are still manually specified here. I see. So that we are trying for future work. So what are the advantages? Some, I mean, these are kind of debatable if they are really advantages or not. What are the main differences? It's like we can get image wrapped to filtering in CNNs. We can also filter an ordered set of points, example, sparse 3D points, which is not very feasible now with CNNs. And we can also get input and output points can be different. For example, we can go from pixels to super pixels and super pixels to pixels, and we can store information at important locations in an image. I didn't understand the the details of the BNN. So can you go back to the previous slide? I think it's, you'll talk about this a lot, mm -hmm. right? So what happened was in a CNN, there are a bank of filters. Yeah. You replaced each one with a bilateral, bilateral bank. Filter. But this diagram of this lattice is like, means that you are going to represent each of them with that high dimensional In this high dimensional space. space. Yeah. Okay. So, so you splat the input, suppose you have, you, you get some input point. You splat these input points to this high dimensional feature space. Right. And you, and we can use multiple filters here. But now, so so uh, all those there were three matrices for each filter, right? Uh, a splat matrix, yeah, the splat w and matrix, and the slice, slice matrix. matrix. We actually so, fix splat and slice. Okay, that's we only learn so the, the only filter. thing that is changing is w, but the, w. the grid is actually fixed. So fixed. slice and splat, splat are the same matrices. Yeah, actually, yeah. we could also do. We can ask, we can also define multiple splattings. Right. But. Uh, Defined. Okay. So, but, so, but is, is it is it a convolutional layer now? Because isn't it just a bunch of linear layers that are multiplied together once you get into once you splat it? Yeah, this is a convolution layer in high dimensional space, not in the original space. Um, so this high dimensional so suppose this, you can we can think of this as a five dimensional but in convolution. Terms of how it's actually like implemented, right? It's basically just once you you do this, you do something that should get it into some space, and now yeah. from that perspective, it's just a bunch of linear. Convolution, yeah. The the main difference is that this is the we have to deal with the sparse points here. In the side dimensional convolution, the points can be dense. Here we have to deal with sparse point. We actually, in terms of implementation, we handle this using hash table, and we only convolve in this sparse space. Otherwise, it will be memory inefficient. Otherwise, we can't fit into memory or the computation. It will be too too much. Mm -hmm. For example, in the five dimensional space. So so we only convolve those lattice points which are populated. Right. So that is the main difference. Yeah, in kind of in the uh, retrospect, it kind of looks obvious, right? But it's kind of, no one did this before. It's kind of no, I mean, I don't think it looks obvious, but I, I'm just trying to think about what it's actually like. Uh, because once you, I mean, because once you get it into that space, there's no real restriction. Like you can start adding all the normal things, like rectified linear units and stuff like that. that yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. We could, we could also do the pooling in that space. Yeah. We could also do that, but we did not try a lot. But yeah, those are those are many pot possible future works. It actually opens up many things in this bilateral space. Nothing. <clears throat> So just to illustrate where this could be used, we, we, we cooked up some example which where this is the given a tile with, with random foreground and random background color. We need to segment that image. So think about, we, we actually cooked this example because this will be easier to solve in high dimensional color space. If we actually project these points to this high dimensional XY RGB space, all these foreground and background points are already separated in this space. So, so the task becomes easier for bilateral filter to solve uh, rather than doing convolution in the original space. Mm -hmm. How many layers did the network have? Uh, uh, I'll come to this, yeah. So actually, we worked with three, three, three different layers, three, three layers, convolutions followed with ReLU. 
and first layer has 32 filters, 16 filters, and again two filters. And the foreground, background, color distributions were exactly were the same. random. Yeah, exactly the same. So, so this kind of very, very, very difficult problem for Norman convolution. So it's really under tries to understand that there's a small shape, and I need to segment. The yeah, shape. segment the shape. So the receptive field for the CNN should be high. To, to actually solve. Was there occlusion or, or there was a small box was al always there? Uh, yeah, small box was always there. No, like no, the no was fully completed. Uh, yeah, fully completed kind of I thing. Think, kind of yeah. But but surprisingly, the CNNs were for small spatial filters. It is not able to solve this problem with 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 small spatial filters. I see. I see. Because it because it can't see the square. What the was image. the pooling? Of, uh, can you show me the architecture again? Uh, there is no pooling. So it's kind of segmentation. Pooling. I see. Kind of thing. Pooling. There's no pooling. Yeah. So we actually replace the convolution layers with the BCL layers, mm -hmm. bilateral convolution layers, with one neighborhood filter in this XY RGB space. So there are some results, and we evaluate, we experiment with the different CNN filter sizes. We use nine by nine filters, thirteen by thirteen, seventeen by seventeen, twenty-one by twenty-one filter sizes, and these are the number of parameters, fifty-one thousand in the in the entire in the entire CNN. No, it's experiment with BNN, these are the number of parameters. As you can see, with this small CNN, it is not converging at all. It's, mm -hmm. We need bigger, large number of parameters and bigger receptive files mm -hmm. to converge. In, in terms of memory requirement, what, mm -hmm. what is the relative difference in the memory requirement for the CNN and DNN? It's a good question. And in terms of memory requirement, there are some extra implement implementation things because we need to store some hash table mm -hmm. those flat splat and slice matrices has to be those are sparse matrices other than that the memory requirement is same because we are also convolving same number of points as the input has but it would actually the memory requirements might go down in some cases if we have big big lattice cells so we are actually pooling number of points into small number of lattice cells Okay. 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 So is it, is it actually the same, once you, once you do the split multiplication mm -hmm. and get out your thing, is it actually the same convolutions as what normally use, or are you just saying that it's, a, it's mathematically an approximation, but it's... it's it, is a, it is the same convolution, but it is done in the sparse, sparse space. So actually we have to do some kind of normalization. For example, normal spatial convolution, if we can actually do the spatial convolution in this 5D space, I can actually define 9 by 9 by 9 by 9 by 9 spatial convolution and, and actually okay. convolve in this space. But this is memory inefficient. We can't fit this into memory. Okay. So, so here, actually, we are taking care of this using some hash table and only, 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 only convolving those points which are populated in this high dimensional space. Yeah. It, is a, it is a sparse space. So the, so the main thing here is dealing with this sparsity. I mean, That's how much, but like, what is the, uh, how much does that actually hurt the, like, if it's super sparse, but you're still using, you know, whatever, 9 by 9, like, how many neighbors are actually? Popular? Yeah, here, 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 actually, we are using one neighborhood filter in this five-dimensional space. But still, it has around 100 parameters, something like that. Okay. Yeah, sure, yeah. If we, if we, uh, actually, we also experimented with two neighborhood. But we observe that one neighborhood works better. What is, one, what is the neighborhood? Neighborhood in this high dimensional space. Uh, for example, here in this. Are you talking the neighbors on the grid? Yeah, neighbors on the grid. For example, this is, this, is, this is one neighborhood. Oh. This is two neighborhood. So the path oh, okay. Kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah, but are there many, is it sparse enough that there's many cases where even with one neighborhood, it's still, it's still not going to have almost any neighbors? Yeah, generally it is it is it is not the case because the image there are many similar points in the image, okay. so many 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 points fall into nearby regions, kind of thing. So so, so thinking again like why <clears throat> why this is working mm -hmm. is actually you are, you are defining your you're going from like low dimension to high dimension by just like uh, x y R B G but mm -hmm. not using any learned features. To define this upsampling, right? Yeah, for now in this work, we are using X Y R G B. I see. And Inlet. this kind of knowledge is this kind of. Yeah, knowledge is helping. This is kind of some kind of prior knowledge. Here, here the prior knowledge is 
very strong. It is saying that all these pixels which are, which are close and are close in RGB should get same label. This can also be extended to natural images, actually. Natural images also. I will show later that this can also be applied in natural images. So the only piece of information that you added mm -hmm. in the system mm -hmm. is, that, is just like the RBG information. Yeah, RGB information. information. Uh, uh, cell similarity. Yeah. Cell similarity. Uh, cell similarity. Of labels. Labels. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, yeah, of the labels and XY. So yeah. it's actually defined in yeah. this. Yeah. We this can, So all these models converge to perfect solution after a long time or time, and convergence of BNN is faster with much smaller number of parameters. And actually, BNNs already see the see the see the color difference. I mean, the task is just to need to assign the labels. This is just to illustrate why this BNN might make sense. It's kind of a toyish example. <clears throat> So the next task we applied is on a sparse character recognition. Like handwriting data is spatially very sparse. Over over 90% of the pixels are background. Background, and this is SMS character data set, and it comes with 183 classes and 45 writers. I think so. We did experiments with this. So so th so th these are the standard CNN architectures that we people are using for one is Linet 7, and there is Deep CNET for this character recognition kind of. It is bunch of convolution layers, and at the end of, we have these inner product layers, mm -hmm. standard classification networks. So how to handle sparsity? So this is an image, and the, this actually covers only these things. So CNN is exhaust, agnostic to the image content. So CNN, if, even though all this data is empty, it does the same convolution everywhere. That is kind of some kind of stupid to do. and. The best we can do is like maybe crop this image, and then do the do the CNN only on this cropped version, this image. But still, the signal is sparse, and we can and I will show how how we can easy to easily handle the sparsity using BNNs. <clears throat> so how can we use bilateral layer to handle sparsity? We can actually only only pass foreground information with BCL to other layers. For example, either I can splat only the forward points. Points, by using these features, like for example, the 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 feature is x y y i position, if p i is foreground, and it is some kind of minus minus hundred or minus one, if it is a background. So all these foreground points are splatted to the one place, and background points are splatted to single point, and then do the convolution in this space. So we experimented this by replacing the first convolution layer using this BCL layer in both Linet and DeepCNet. Networks. So there are some empirical results in terms of training performance. We get better convergence, BNN, and compared to Linet, and also in compared to crop version. We also train another Linet using only the cropped images. Have you thought about comparing this with a, a more sophisticated attention mechanism, uh, a network which has a proper attention mechanism? Because this yeah sort of, yeah uh, th that is kind of a very very interesting question actually. The the present attention mechanisms actually. They work mainly spatial at attention mechanism. Yeah. Actually, this actually allows to have attention in high dimensional space. Like, I mean, the attention need not be spatially closed, right? I mean, it can yeah. be high dimensional. Exactly. That's, a, that's a very interesting question. That, uh, that's a very interesting thing to work on, but we did not work on. No, it's kind of question. So in both LNET and DeepCNET, actually, we get improvements in terms of numbers and also in terms of convergence. So these are the two. Main things we work with the bilateral neural networks, and we are all planning to work on things like. So, third consequence is this learning bilateral filters is that generalizing dense CRFs. So, dense CRF uh, is, are, are people here familiar with dense CRF, densely connected random fields? Or this is a brief some, some people would be familiar, yeah. but you should go ahead we'll and, go ahead and like explain, explain the, the whole context. context yeah. Okay, so the dense CRF is a conditional random field where every pixel in the image is connected to every other pixel. For example, this is the, how the energy looks like. Like, it is the sum of all unary potentials. Unary potentials are defined at every pixel, and this is the sum of all pairwise potentials, where every pixel is connected, every ith pixel is connected to every jth pixel. So it has found many applications in vision, like segmentation, optical flow, intrinsic images, etc. So, so Cranbull et al. proposed this mean field inference technique using bilateral filtering. 
For example, main field updates can be computed using bilateral filtering like this. Like this involves, let's say we have some input, you get some unaries after some processing, let's say CNN. And each of the mean field step involves first running bilateral filter using pairwise potentials as your filter kernel. And bilateral filtering the beliefs using the bilateral filter and then adding the unaries back and then doing again softmax. And this is one main field step. So this is how dense CRF inference is done in dense CRF. So all the existing works use Gaussian pairwise potentials. This psi p is defined as Gaussian pairwise potentials, e power fi minus fj square. So this, this corresponds to Gaussian bilateral filter. One of the main reasons to propose Gaussian pairwise potentials is that we people mainly have Gaussian bilateral filtering available. <clears throat> so with our technique, we don't need to confine to Gaussian, Gaussian potentials anymore. We can actually back propagate through mean field inference, back propagate through all of these steps, and then we can actually learn these permutoidal filters. This actually corresponds to learning pairwise potentials in dense CRF. And moreover, we can actually learn different pairwise potentials in different steps of mean field. We don't need to use same pairwise potentials anymore. This, this we call loose mean field. And we applied this for a task of semantic segmentation, which is a main example for dense CRF. Thing. Here, this, the, the task is assigning semantic meaning to every pixel, like chair, plant, etc. So here, these white pixels are unlabeled data. So already, like, this was like published work, or like? Yeah, this this is, this is, the, this is, I mean, like in the previous, the previous slide, so this mm -hmm. is your? So uh, yeah, so this is the the dense CRF is already published, okay. and this DOM case work they showed that we can back propagate through mean field, but, but without all using the bilateral 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 without lens bilateral filter. So all the existing works use Gaussian filtering I see. and Gaussian various potentials. So what you're calling dense CRF is actually fully connected CRF. Yeah, fully connected yeah. CRF. Yeah. Dense can be also like not fully connected. Yeah, fully yeah. connected. Yeah, yeah. yeah. fully connected CRF. Yeah, fully that connected paper CRF. Was just doing inference, no learning, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just doing it was just showing that how this approach. Yeah. yeah for example, there is there is another another recent work from Philip Tor's group that mm -hmm. where they can back where they show that it is a back propagate through this dense CRF, yeah. and we can learn with re, with with CNN this, also. Uh, this is the so they call it paper. yeah CRF as RNN CRF paper, as RNN. Yeah. but still they are using Gaussian filters. So they are using Gaussian filters, but they show that we can actually learn end to end mm -hmm. things. So we, this is one more step, like. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what is so good about dense CRF? Actually, we can observe big improvements over CNN with dense CRF on top. Here these are the results on two different data sets. One is Pascal VOC. With, with the CNN, we get 68.9 IOU. By adding dense CRF, we get around 4% improvement. And the next one with the material segmentation on MINK data set. We get with CNN 55.3 class accuracy. With with dense CRF, we get big improvements. And this is one visual result. This is input ground truth, and this is CNN result. It looks blobby because it is trained on pixels. Just, and with adding dense CRF, we get very crisp result. I just quite understand why the upper left is breaking up the sky when the sky is actually quite uniform. Why is it doing that? Uh, why That's is the CNN this one? Just CNN. Going <laughs> I mean, it is. I think there's no uncertainty, and all these labels have equal cost or something. So okay. Essentially, yeah. just sh shows you that neural networks <laughs> in computer vision are uh, not up to stuff. Yeah, not up to. They don't okay. have much. Uh, yeah, I mean, we still have uh, not much understanding, but 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 it's quite amazing actually, but, how how this is picking up these. But I think like, like what's in your mission now? You have a dense array. Now you have a model that potentially yeah. would learn this yeah. uh, global structure as well. So why, why do you think that it's not learning yet? Yeah. Then CRF. No, then then CRF is only used as a post-processing step. Post -processing. Do, he he doesn't do ba uh, uh, sort of uh, overall backdrop. Oh, I thought that you did. No, so, so, no. so he he does not do. So that's what I was asking him uh, like initially. That do you do the full backdrop through the CNN as well? The CNN feature, the CNN output is fixed. And then the, the, the then CRF is just doing the inference. So it is taking the CNN output as unary potentials, mm -hmm. fixed unary potentials, and saying, 
Now, basically, I will learn to do inference in a graphical model which has unit potential given by the CNN and the pairwise potential that are defined uh, will be learned by me. But he is backdrop to learn the bilateral filter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Only, yeah, only the bilateral filter. filter. Yeah, so not the CNN. CNN. Yeah, the, the ideal situation would be to, 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 to learn the whole all. backdrop and learn the CNN. Actually, the one reason we did not do it is actually, actually we don't believe in dense CRF a lot. Yeah. I will show you why yeah. later. Okay. We don't believe in density RF a lot, so I will show you why later in some of the experiments. So, so you, have, you have two events. Yeah, sure, yeah. Let's, let's yeah, yeah, I think we'll stop. <laughs> so we, we experiment with two different data sets. One is semantic segmentation on Pascal Vivos, and there is material segmentation on Ming data set. These are some numbers. Maybe I will quickly go through the numbers. It's not very important, because what we observe is that with, with learned CRF, we get improvements. And this is a two-step mean field, and it's kind of loose two-step. We learn different filters in different main field step. This is one visual result. As you can see, some some regions get better with learned CRF compared to dense CRF. Here, only learning dense CRF, not learning CNN. So dense CRFs are good, but they are time taken compared to many 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 CNN approaches. So what we are, so we don't believe in dense CRF that much. Can so what what dense CRF is doing? It is mainly doing propagating information between the pixels, which has similar RGB values kind of thing. So can we, can we actually do the same propagation inside CNN itself? It could be even better, right? I mean, propagate CNN. So we don't need to apply the post-processing thing. Your PNN stuff does that, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so we, we actually have to improve the BNN to some things to, to, me, to, to make it feasible for real world things. So I will show you. So this is how the general architecture for segmentation CNN. So there are a bunch of convolution layers followed with FC layers. FC, FC is kind of one by one convolutions. Yeah. People call it fully convolution layers. And then we get some low resolution image because of max pooling and striding. And we upsample it using interpolation CRF or deconvolution techniques. So it's generally required using post-processing techniques. So can we? Can we actually propagate inside CNN itself? So, so, so we propose something called bilateral inception mm -hmm. module, where we can insert between any two layers in the existing CNN, and this can actually propagate information between the pixels. And now, do you do full backdrop? Yeah. Now, now, now we learn all yes. the things. We learn all the things. So, we call this bilateral inception modules. This is slightly different from the previous work because. Uh, this is how the bilateral, I will briefly explain what is bilateral inception module is. So this is a previous layer output, and we actually do the bilateral filtering, Gaussian bilateral filtering in different feature spaces. Feature spaces, there are different feature spaces, and we can actually linearly combine them to get certain. And the feature spaces are learned or? Uh... Here, actually, the feature spaces are learned because we use super pixels. Superpixels. So here we actually explicitly we don't use perimetrohedral approximation here. We explicitly do the entire filter thing, and we actually learn the feature transformations from the thing. So also, the question was, I've heard of inception. Some yeah, because we call this inception is uh, because we we got this name from the Google inception module. So, what, what exactly is it? so this kind of they, they use inception because. It can be easily plugged into existing networks. But can you def define what they mean by? Because the they call. Yeah. What the layer looks like. A layer looks like uh, the Inception module. Actually, they got the name from the Inception movie, <laughs> so yeah. there is no okay. formal definition of what okay. is Inception. Inception movie, and it's kind of like they say, it does filtering in different levels, and then combine them together. Okay. For example, one by one, three by three, five by five convolution. An up sample. No, it is kind of like convolution with different filter sizes. Okay. Instead of one filter size oh, in normal CNN, different, different convolution different. with different filter sizes and then combine together. Here, here we, it is kind of looking similar, right? It's we are convolution with different bilateral filters, and then going through. So we actually use super pixels instead of pixels because it's faster and it's we can deal with unordered points. So why is this technique interesting and useful? Because this this enables doing long range information propagation between CNN units before actually condensed to label size. All the dense CRF and other post-processing techniques, we actually first condense to label size, maybe let's say 21 labels, mm -hmm. and then doing the information propagation. By doing information propagation inside CNN itself, we're actually 
we can actually potentially get better results. And it could also help grouping similar pixels would also help in later processing also. For example, FC layers already know all these pixels are grouped. Now the task becomes easier also. <clears throat> so the, I will show one results on Pascal VOC with Deep Lab network. And there are also more results in the paper. <clears throat> so we took the Deep Lab segmentation network and we added inception modules in, inside it. Mm -hmm. So BA6 of 2 represent bilateral inception after FC6 layer mm -hmm. and with two kernels, is the number of kernels. So we just train the module with, by fixing the other network. So this gives some improvement compared to Deep Lab. Do you see run, runtime? You mean like inference time? Yeah, entire inference time. This is 135 milliseconds. We are 20, 20 milliseconds on top. So by with with the joint training of entire CNN and also this, we get some other improvements. Since. And by adding more kernels, six kernels instead of two, we get better improvements. And by adding every anywhere, we get some improvements. After FC6 or FC7 or FC8, we get improvements. But going down now, 72.0. Yeah, because this is only BA8, this is BA7, BA6. So, yeah, we we actually observe that BA's earlier stages work slightly better than the last stage. And adding adding multiple modules further helps for BA6, BA7, or BA7, BA8 kind of thing. <clears throat> so this has the result with the CRF. This is the this is the dense CRF. Dense CRF result is worse than this, using bilateral inception. And it takes much longer compared to using bilateral inception things. And, and there is also multi-scale version of Deep Lab, mm -hmm. where they use multi, multiple scales of the input. And you get the similar results. But here again, it, it actually uses CRF on top, the same result. And there are actually more other recent works, which is called EdgeNet, that also do the dense pixel predictions mm -hmm. things. So we get we get favorably better result compared to their number and their runtime. But these two techniques are totally independent, right? Uh, which two techniques? Your technique and then whatever you do on the output layer to combine them with the CRF. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this is this is just a this is just a comparison with. So, but did you try them both? Did you try them and you, you you do yours and then also do the CRF on top of it? Yeah, we tried, but it did not give much improvements because we are actually propagating the same similar information. Inside CNN itself. Yep. And then this baseline over there is so not a dense CRF, it's normal CRF. Uh, this, is, this is a dense CRF. Dense CRF. Dense CRF, yeah, this is also dense CRF. And lo learned dense CRF or? Uh, yeah, actually, Gaussian, with Gaussian in, uh, pairwise potential. With Gaussian pairwise potential. With Gaussian. Here, with Gaussian potential. And, and, but the point is, you, in your comparison, you basically did the, uh, the bilateral, bilateral learning. Bilateral learning, and yeah, we could also learn, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, uh, we also experimented with some other model at CRF as RNN model also. Mm -hmm. We also get improvements compared to dense CRF there. I see. Yeah. So uh, where did and you implement this sort of stuff in? Uh, in 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 cafe. In cafe. Cafe. Yeah, we will release code in a couple of weeks. Okay. This is just accepted to CVPR, so the previous work. Can I ask one question now? Um, there were two yeah. papers I was familiar with. Uh, one was the FC and the, the, the mm -hmm. CVPR paper from long, Berkeley. Long. Then the work from Field Group, uh, Phil Torres. Yeah, actually. Jasuma and CRF. CRF. What, what accuracies were they, uh, did they have? Like, do you remember? Like, Yeah, at present, the state of the art is around 77. So they are, they, uh, but uh, this is newer work, right? Like, that stuff was older. Like, what? Yeah, but, but, but here, uh, here the main point is to how can we improve existing network? It is not like uh, we are not. Raj, I'm just uh, ask, like I'm just trying to gauge like how much it things have improved. Like one year ago, like what these numbers like 50, 60, like or. Like yeah, before ago? before before CNNs the numbers are around 50. After that long paper and other CNNs, now numbers went up to 77. It was a quite big improvement. So what system is has 77? There is some other work on deep parsing networks and deep, deep parsing networks. And uh, now the Philip Torres group also has some other system which works quite well. So here, actually, there are some other. We, we also introduce inception modules in some other networks and also showed improvements there. So there are some visual results, super pixels, ground truth, deep lab results, which, is, which looks blobby because 
it has a low resolution and this is a dense CRF result and this is kind of using bilateral inception module. We actually rectify some of the, the dense CRF is mainly doing the crisping the input image. We are actually rectifying some of the things using bilateral inception. <coughs> So since you are using superpixel, we want to study whether we can generalize to other superpixel layouts. For example, we train on 1000 superpixels, can this also work on 600 and 200 superpixels? So to, so to study this, we actually hierarchically cluster these superpixels into different number of superpixels like 100, 200, 300, like that. And we actually observe that the accuracy is dropping only marginally as the number of superpixels are going down. So this shows that with this also system also generalizes to other super pixel layouts, not only on the trained ones. So in summary, bilateral filters provide simple rich framework for information propagation and learning, as I have shown in the presentation, learning bilateral filters has many useful consequences and problem specific filters can be learned and at JVR CRS we can have bilateral neural networks and generalized dense CRF to non-Gaussian potentials. These are the three main consequences we studied. And as, you know, as I also showed that information propagation can be done inside CNN itself. We don't need to do later pre post-processing. So why, and another question is why, why always grid layouts for CNNs? The, the grid is particular layout. With this approach, we can use any other layouts. And we can actually store information in interesting locations. So this is a summary for this work. And overall conclusion, overall work is like, there are many two main approaches for vision, generative and discriminative approaches. And previous works on informed sample and consensus message passing, we, we bring the both worlds closer together a little bit. And in this newer work, we show that learning bilateral filters helps in propagation inside CNN itself. So we can get the speed of CNNs and also adding some prior knowledge into it. And the future outlook, so how to bring more prior knowledge into CNNs. Here we bring only very minor prior knowledge. How to bring more prior knowledge into CNNs while maintaining fast run times and in general, my uh, main interest is like how can we bridge gap between these two models to further the, to advance the techniques we use for vision problems. Yep, that's it. Thanks. Mm -hmm.